for Virtual Global Spine. I'm Wendy Gibbs, and I'm joined by co-hosts John Shin, John Rizzuli, Nader Dadale, and hopefully soon, Chloe Tan. And we're very lucky today to have John Shin presenting some fantastic tumor cases and some complications that go along with that kind of surgery. And we have Matt Goodwin from WashU back with us to share one of his great cases. So why don't we go ahead and get started? John, if you want to share your screen. Okay, great. I'm going to share and just tell me if you're looking at the presentation screen, because sometimes it shows the, uh, um, the other person's screen. So hold on one second. Well, he's getting started. Everyone, as always, I think most people here have joined us before, but make sure you enter your questions and your comments in the chat box and we'll be, we'll all be watching so we can pass these along and get you some answers. Wendy, are you seeing the... I am the seeing the, uh, the kind of the speaker view where you have your oh, you next are? slide. Okay. Um... How about now? That looks good. Looks better? Okay. Okay. Um, just give me one second. This is really annoying. Hold on one second. Okay, I'm gonna do this. Okay, all right. Well, welcome everybody. It's, uh, thanks for joining us tonight. And um, please fire away any questions in the chat box. And I, it's sort of hard for me to look at that. So hopefully someone else will prompt with the questions. Uh, I have two cases and, um, and please interrupt. Uh, this is really meant for discussion. And uh, uh, they'll touch upon some complications. I know Matt has a great case and maybe more. Uh, so let's just launch into it, okay? So here's a case. Uh, this is a 59 year old who has metastatic renal cell carcinoma that presented with a thoracic uh, pathological fracture spinal cord compression. Okay. Uh, we've talked about this uh, in the past and a number of the faculty have done webinars and this and other venues uh, talking about this. So I won't go over in too much detail, but uh, as you can see here, actually, Wendy, what do you think here? What do you, what do you see here in uh, the thoracic spine? This is a T8 level. I was talking without unmuting. On your sagittal um, post-contrast fat saturated image there, well, actually on the other one too, the T2, you've got that central black. So that's basically T1 hypo intensity. Usually the only time you see something like that is if it's cement or air. So there's something already in that vertebral body besides just tumor, I believe. Is that correct? And around yeah, it, you've got enhancement, unless yeah, it's an unusual right. necrotic tumor, um, enhancement, and you've got your pathologic fracture retropulsion into the canal and some epidural extension of disease compressing the cord. Yeah, no, that's perfect. This patient had a pathological fracture treated with cement augmentation uh, previously. Uh, then had radiation to that area. And as you can see, as, as Wendy said, uh, there's a big black blob right in the middle of that vertebral body, right? Uh, and so this patient presented with circumferential epidural spinal cord compression. I think we can all see that here, right, on the axial image. Um, there are different grading scales, Bilski scale, uh, whatever you want to call it, you can see that there's a lot of compression there. Um, and this is just sort of the backstory. I'm going to get to the heart of the case in a second. But we go through our algorithm, right? We think about the SIN score. We can go through that. We think about the radio sensitivity of the tumor. And uh, I know Wendy's talked about this a lot in the past. Uh, and so in our treatment paradigm, we're thinking about separation surgery for a radio resistant tumor with a high SIN score presenting with high-grade epidural spinal cord compression, I don't think we're gonna to get too many uh, arguments there. Uh, and so this patient, I took him for, to surgery. He got preoperative embolization with coils. Uh, and as you can see here, two levels up, two levels down with fenestrated screws. There's some cement uh, in the uh, vertebral bodies there. Um, I did end up resecting that vertebral body and reconstructing with a cage because despite the embolization, it 
it just bled a lot, lost several liters of blood with that. Um, and uh, to the far right, I'll tell you from my own naive point of view, it looks pretty good uh, in terms of reconstituting that cerebrospinal fluid around the spinal cord. And the patient did fairly well from that, okay? So now let's flash forward a bit. He also had an L2 vertebral body lesion. Um, and um, Wendy, what do you think of that? Um, that lesion. I know it's not fair. I'm giving you one slice there, um, but uh, with that MRI on the left. Yeah, I keep forgetting to unmute myself. So what do I think about it? Yeah, so you, so it was a, a MET. You said you gave it serotactic radiosurgery. It looks like you have new um, compression. You have a pathologic fracture. You've got retropulsion into the canal. So that could be and post um, treatment, you still have enhancement in the body. Now, is that residual or recurrent tumor, or is that enhancement related to the pathologic fracture that is solely related to your SRS? Yeah, that's a great point. So right here, the patient had uh, some marrow you know, replacements with cancer in L2, and at the time, you know, wasn't really having much back pain. I mean, he was having some back pain, but not mechanical in nature. You know, it's the type of pain that's just sort of there all the time, maybe a little worse at night and in the morning, but it wasn't weight dependent, it didn't have a radiculopathy. And so we treated this with a single fraction radiosurgery, which at our, our center is 18 grain, a single fraction and we give a 24 gray boost to the, um, the gross tumor volume, okay? Uh, and six months later, he's coming in now with a lot of back pain and now with ridiculous symptoms. So when he stands and walks, he's getting a lot of pain there. So I, I think you're right, Wendy. When we look at it, we're thinking, you know, is this, is this all changed because of the fracture or is this actually maybe treatment response from the radiation or is it progression that's there right and i think that yeah. I, I you know i don't do any brain surgery anymore unless literally no one is around but i think that the brain tumor surgeons also have this concept of sort of pseudo progression right on mri imaging sometimes after radiation what do you think of that wendy yeah so that's a great a great topic that was something that was very interesting to me a few years ago um so in the brain, yes, you have pseudoprogression. The brain is very different from the spine. Brain tissue has a very predictable response and it's very homogeneous. Almost everybody's brain is actually the same, but everybody's marrow is different and you don't measure any kind of, um, what, tumor, pseudoprogression or perfusion of the marrow or content of the marrow. Everybody's different, you can't measure it the same way. So this is a really big problem in spine oncology is how can we differentiate changes in vertebral bodies that have been treated with, with the stereotactic uh, radio surgery or, or body radiotherapy. Um, it's extremely hard to tell because that enhancement could be tumor or it could be fracture. So I, I kind of jumped the gun. I maybe gave you a little bit more of an answer than you were asking. But um, no, I, no, I think that's great. And you know, when I look at this post contrast MRI on the right, you know, when I look at this, I, I may be misinterpreting this. I want to know what you think. I mean, this enhancement here, you know, that to me looks like the retropulse bone and tumor is pushing back into the spinal canal, but it's the posterior longitudinal ligament that's sort of holding that together. Yes. Um, is that, yeah. and you think that contrast is sort of like, is it like venous enhancement or is it just that it's the PLL? I, I agree with you. I think that's, I, I think it's not epidural disease basically is what you're saying. Yeah. Um, whether it's the, you know, the ligament and some venous enhancement or whatever, but it's still, that I don't think helps you decide whether the enhancement in the body is tumor or not. Right. It's tumor or, or, you know, enhancement related to a fracture could still have that same appearance. Right. So that's what's containing it basically. No, that, that 
Yeah, that's great. No, so I wanted to touch upon that because a lot of times I think like as surgeons, we think, oh, they're just going to get radiation, like sign off and you just kind of like, you know, leave the room, you know, but I think that the reality is that especially with the high dose radiation, giving it 18 to 24 gray, you know, you can really do some damage. And as that tumor starts to necrose, it's just going to leave a hole in the body and sometimes fractures can happen. I'm going to actually show my next case. I'm going to show uh, that also in a little more... Um, significant way. But, and this is the axial imaging. So I think on the left, that's a T2 on the right, post contrast, anything alarming mm -hmm. there, Wendy, or out of the ordinary that you would say? Yeah, well, I mean, the axial to me looks a little bit scarier than the sagittal did. Um, but boy, I, I still think we can't tell um, whether it's tumor or not. I don't think we know. Okay. I do think there's no epidural disease. So I think we can say that. Right. Okay. So we got some CT imaging and um, I just took some representative shots of sort of the, you know, view of the right sort of lateral wall, right pedicle, and also the left side. Um, and how would you, what do you think of the bone marrow here and just the bone quality, Wendy, if you, I mean, is, do you think that you know, I, there have been some studies out recently looking at other markers of bone density. You know, I think Shuba put one out recently, and there's been some work looking at other markers of that. Um, you About know, whether think, it's osteoporotic or not. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. what do you think? I mean, I'll, clearly at the level, you know, it's lytic there, right? But then I don't know, everywhere else, maybe it's just the imaging quality, but and what do you think of that? So it's interesting because that. It, you could measure Hounsfield units on your CT scanner on the computer and try to decide whether you think there's normal bone density, but that number is actually not as real as we think. And that even depends on the weight of the patient or the size of their, the soft tissues around that area. That'll differ. Um, I don't think there is a good marker for um, bone mineral density yet with imaging. It's a little bit more complicated than people think. So they could very well be osteoporotic. I do think the quality is poor because all the noise in the bones is the same as the noise in your soft tissues. Um, I don't think you can make a judgment really on that. But yeah. your tumor, the lytic tumor itself, does have very sclerotic margins, um, which is interesting because that's something we usually would see you know, with a treated tumor or with a slower growing tumor, not something very aggressive that kind of eats away and is more permeative and lytic without leaving kind of that dense margin. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely. So I don't know, maybe you and uh, Rasuli can come up with some great uh, machine learning algorithm to develop yeah. that. You know? And, uh, and uh, you know, that, that'd be great. So what's the plan here? What do you guys, what, what does everyone think here? Any, any ideas in the chat box? Any of the, uh, any of the co-hosts, anyone think here? We've got pathological fracture, treated with radio surgery, back and leg pain, symptomatic, high SIN score, brace, cement, RFA. We had a great invited speaker before about all these uh, interventional percutaneous techniques. What do you guys think? Spine jack? I mean, what, 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 what do people think here? I think you need to biopsy and see what it is, unless you're sure it's tumor. Uh, let's just say we're sure it's tumor because okay. he has pre-diffuse disease. Excellent functional status, but he's got tumor there. Any takers to surgery? Okay, and if surgery, what would you do? All posterior? So here, John, I'm looking at the anterior. chat box. Yeah. Some, some suggestions. MIS stabilization posteriorly. Uh, there's also a good comment by uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Galgano. Uh, so he's saying, can you comment on the on generally perceived tolerance of the coda equina to SRS without necessarily doing a separation surgery? Yeah, so usually the coda equina is pretty tolerant, you know. So usually the dose constraint to the spinal cord is usually – uh, like eight or 10 gray to a single like voxel in the cord. The cauda quina tissue constraints are typically a little more than that. So maybe 12 to 14 gray. 
but this patient got a pretty significant dose before. So, um, you know, I don't think we can attribute the new symptoms to, let's say, radiation effect, you know, being within six months of the, uh, the treatment. So other suggestions, you know, uh, stabilization posterior per percutaneously, uh, corpectomy and stabilization. Okay. Uh, these are the, these are the uh, options okay. to palliate. And I'm just showing this uh, standing scoliosis x-ray because it's just showing the, uh, the construct from before, okay? So, um, so great idea. So considering all that, so what I did, I ended up doing a um, mini open uh, retroperitoneal uh, corpectomy, intralesional vertebrectomy, uh, embolization, all of that, okay? You can see the cage reconstruction here, uh, expandable titanium cage, uh, anterior plating, screws going all the way across. Uh, looked good, felt good, patient felt great. Um, and uh, I thought it was really a great result. You know, he had SRS before, so no plan for radiation afterwards. This was a intralesional gross total resection. Not to say that you have to take it all out, but as I mentioned before, it bleeds. And so sometimes the only way to get control is to, um, to cancel it and resect it all out. Now, but now three months later, this happened. What do you think? Nader, what do you see, man? What do you, what do you see happen here? Yeah, I see that uh, there has been, uh, uh, you know, failure of the construct, uh, anterior migration of the, uh, of the um, corp expandable cage, um, uh, and, you know, a hardware failure. Let me see if uh, the other image here on the left side. That's what I see here. Uh, you can see, yeah, anterior migration of the cage, plowing maybe of the lateral screws and uh, migrating anteriorly. Yeah. Some kyphosis. Okay. Now, I, I put the zoomed up x-ray because I wanted you to take a look at it. Now, before, it, was, mm -hmm. it was a relatively intralesional resection. And you look at that, I took it all the way past the pedicle on that side, if you look at that middle thing. Mm -hmm. um, Wendy, what do you think of that? Do you think, which, which vertebral body do you think that is? Or where do you think that cage is? Um, yeah, uh, where do I think the cage is? Yeah, Let's see. Yeah. I mean, it looks like it's still on your, your uh, coronal view. It looks like it's still in the midline. Yeah. And it's just, I don't quite know where, I mean, has wow. it expanded more than it was originally? No, no. It kind of popped out and expanded more. I don't know quite what's happening there. It looks like you're <laughs> missing a body, but then there's a, it looks like it spans two levels. Yeah. It's really yeah. wide. <laughs> Exactly. I don't know, Matt. I mean, what do you think? I mean, uh, I, I wish. I, I mean, I wanted to think that it expanded after surgery somehow, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I was sort of in disbelief when I saw this. I, uh, I almost had to like leave the room, you know. But I don't know. What do you, Matt? What do you think of that? Yeah, it's pretty impressive. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, it clearly, you know, it looks like it plowed through, you know, the uh, the vertebrae above it. Uh, uh, if I'm doing my math correctly here, because I was thinking about backing up, backing it up, and and how close that would take me to that construct above, and right. and then would I have to connect versus leave a couple a segment there? So, yeah, it looks like uh, <laughs> uh, it looks like totally collapsed through, maybe plowed through the front of that, and and um, is now kind of sitting on the one above that one. It looks like at least yeah. on the on the edge of it. Yeah, so, yeah, so exactly. Initially, I looked at it, and I was like, oh, yeah, it's just, uh, it slid out a little bit, screws pulled out. But then I, then I looked at it again, and I was thinking, wait a second, I think it actually just collapsed and spit out almost anteriorly, you know? Um, so anyway, um, here's some better views, because, you know, uh, we have to own the complication, and uh, we have to share our failures with the radiologists. So, um, uh, what do you what do you think here, Wendy? What do you does this give you a better view of what's going on? Um, well, I think what Matt just said is is correct. I mean, it this, it sheared off the the vertebral body above and is in the one even above that. So five, four, three, uh, two, and one. Or wait, what are we missing? We're missing two, right? We're missing, yeah, we're missing two. I took out two. So then part, so the front half of one is sheared off and then 
maybe the very anterior aspect of 12? Yeah, yeah. Where it's landed, kind of. I think so, yeah. I, I, I honestly, I, I think part of it, I, I think part of one is, I think, up here somewhere, you know. Um, oh it's, pretty, it's pretty dramatic, you know. And I, I love this one because it looks like there's a, just like a dog bone in the spine, you know. But... Um, no, you might have said, I might have missed it. And what, and what um, happened at this point or what's the patient's symptoms? And, and He's just having a lot, a lot more back pain. You know, a lot more back pain. He's starting to uh, just couldn't really stand upright. A lot of fatigue with ambulation. Um, no, no leg symptoms. Just really could not support his own weight and spending more time, uh, like in a recliner. And these are the axial images here. Okay. And again, just because we we we've got to share the uh, the glory here. We got an MRI. Okay. Um, and showing that, hey, you know, like nerves look okay. So for all the neurosurgeons here, we're, we're feeling pretty good because like nothing to decompress, right? So, but, um, but yeah, it's pretty, pretty bad. So we got all the imaging, x-ray, CT, MRI. Now what? That's a standing Scully film. That's the CT. Any takers here? Anyone want to go back anteriorly? take out more of L1, reposition the cage and the screws, redo that, and then go posterior, or just fixate in the back, or send it you to- You know, it looks like L5 is gonna go soon too, just yeah. for your planning. Yeah, or, or send it to Matt Goodwin, or, you know, <laughs> Ali Baj, or, you know. Any takers here? What's everyone and then how And then how much is this? This probably, you probably don't have much time in, in look, I mean, you get the feeling this is sitting there or is this, you know what I mean? Like they've been hurting for a month or something and you might have a couple of weeks of images where it looks like it's kind of. I know. Yeah. I, I, I watched it for about a month because I, I think, you know, just you, you kind of need a little time to digest it and he was doing okay. So uh, I didn't feel like there was any urgent need to do anything. Um, plus, as you can see here in between the time of this surgery and this, he also had a C2 pathological fracture that I had treated and he had done quite well. So he's been through a lot, you know, so it was one of those things where, you know, he wasn't really interested in rushing back to do anything, but his pain was getting worse. And his prognosis is still good in terms of uh, Karnofsky. Yeah, very functional. Prominent. The Karnofsky score is okay. Otherwise, yeah. disease is controlled and all that. So he can't right. tolerate. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it's to be um, uh, fixed again, remove the cage and uh, extend the corpectomy, get to good end plates yeah. and put a big expandable cage and then go from the back and support it. You got to probably connect to the posterior hardware. Problem is the bottom, you know, I mean, you have L5 is involved. Yeah. Yeah. So where you want to stop at the bottom, L4, or are you going to go down to the pelvis? That's, uh, that's you know, I mean. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough, I know. Tough. So uh, you're, you're braver than I am because that's, <laughs> that's not what I did. Um, so he had a nephrectomy for his renal cell, plus I did this retroperitoneal exposure, and he just did, really did not want to do that. So I uh, took this approach. I just took him from behind. I tried to correct for his kyphosis. Uh, and extend them and double up the rods a little bit to provide some stability there. Um, I debated about going to the pelvis and doing something at L5 with cement augmentation, pelvic fixation. You know, I, I just, I think of these patients and we're thinking about their alignment, but I'm not thinking, him, I'm not thinking of him and many of these patients as deformity patients. Maybe we should be, but. Um, I think it looks awesome. You know, this is like now probably about 18 months and he's doing very well, you know. So, I, you know, I, for me, I think this was like, I, I tried to salvage this hardware complication and I was sort of kicking myself because I thought I should have backed it up up front, you know, but it was just, I was so happy that his posterior incision had healed well before, you know, and I think it's just uh, sort of picking your uh, demons, you know. But yeah, John, uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard because it, when you presented it, my thought originally was, was I, I would back it up and then I saw what you did and I thought, well, that's not a bad idea. Cause if you back it up, how, you know, where are you going to, you going to leave that level in between? Like I was saying, are you going to yeah. connect them? Now you connect them. You're worried about, uh, you know, you're worried about failure above and below. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know. I think this is, this is really nice. I mean, also I feel like this patient typically doesn't want you to go back in and muck around with the cage. If you can do this, you know what I mean? I mean, I, I totally, 
uh, I think this is a, a great idea. And, you know, I worry about below too, but, you know, I, you know, at least here we talk a little bit about leaving that kind of toggle room below in these patients with really poor bone that you know they're going to be prone to collapse above this thing. I mean, I, I think it's a, I think that's a, I think it's really nice. Okay. Well, uh, let me just get to the next one. I'm going to uh, go through that. And then, Matt, I'm going to hand it off to you, okay? Is that all right? Perfect. Yeah. Hey, wait, so John, got... before you go on, yeah. can I ask? I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. I am yeah, very no, sorry. This is, it's not exactly about this case, but it's uh, relating to Dr. Galgano's comment about the separation surgery. Yeah. So um, for, for the people on here, I think most people probably know what that is. But if there's a lot of epidural disease, you know, you, you respect that before they get the radiation, right? That's the simplest yes. way to say it. So this came up for us very, very recently. What if your renal cell looks like it's expanding the bone such that it's compressing the cord? You might give it an epidural spinal cord compression grade two, say. But it's not, it's bone expansion. It's not exactly the soft tissue epidural stuff that we're used to seeing. Does that matter to you guys as surgeons? Does that, um, I think it'd be harder to resect that. Can you still do a separation surgery? Is it a different type of surgery? Does that, does that kind of make sense without yeah, no, a picture I, what I'm describing? I, yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. I think that's always tough when people have like grade two epidural compression where uh, maybe it's just along the dura or maybe there's a little bit of dural indentation uh, and you want to treat it with SRS, but the radiation oncologist may be very worried about the dose constraint, you know, and the fall off. Because uh, what, what they'll end up do, doing is they'll end up underdosing the margin of tumor that's right against the dura, and then that's what eventually will fail, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, we're pretty aggressive about separating that disease. Uh, in those cases, you know, if there's not so much epidural disease, it doesn't bleed as much because there isn't this extra osseous extension versus this vertebral body expansion. Uh, so in those cases, you know, like there are many cases with RCC where I'll think I'll just do a separation surgery, but we end up doing a vertebrectomy because it bleeds so much, like in this case. But in cases where it's really primarily this vertebral body or pedicle expansion, I really haven't had, I really found that. I found that that to be a little bit different in terms of how that behaves intraoperatively. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Sure. So um, I want, I definitely want to get to Matt, but I want to review this case. Um, this is a case of a patient who is in her, fi in her 50s, had a previous right upper lobe lung resection for lung cancer and uh, uh, had chemo radiation. This was a um, complete resection and had uh, really no evidence of disease whatsoever. Um, and uh, Wendy, what do you, uh, this is a, a CT of the, the chest here. What do you, um, what, can, what can you make of it? This was a, this was a right side uh, resection here. Um, is there anything here you can see close to the spine or involving the rib that makes you suspicious for anything? Um, I mean, it's hard for me to tell on the, the first picture. You said there was total, there was a lobectomy, is that what you said? There was a and lobectomy and partial chest wall resection. Okay, so uh, that's what that thing is in the back, behind yeah. the resected lung. The, yeah. So I, I don't like looking anything but the spine. To me in yeah. this picture, the spine looks okay. Yeah. Um, second picture, you have probably, well, it's hard to tell. I was going to say you have maybe Mets in that rib, but you have other bones look dense, so maybe that's artifact. Okay. I don't know. So six months later, she presents with a lot more chest wall pain, and um, there's clearly something going on here. And again, this is at the level of T3, T4. Um, and you can see the vertebral body looks okay there, but... Uh, on the right side, you know, this is, they left like a, a big patch in their chest wall reconstruction. Um, and again, this was a, um, you know, pre, this is an oncologic resection for this lung cancer. Um, and we're seeing this abnormality there. MRI, now we're back to uh, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, Wendy's uh, wheelhouse here. So Wendy, here, this is the MRI. Uh, and I labeled the T4 level here. This is just T1. What, what do you think of this? You're saying that the CT was not my wheelhouse, the CT of the chest. Um, wow. So, I mean, the T1 hypo intensity, that is certainly tumor. I'm trying to see where it's coming from on these pictures. On your second picture, it looks like it's filling the neural foramen at least. Yeah. Um, 
and you're coming way off to the side. Uh, T2 root up there, boy, I don't know. I, I mean, I would have to see some axials probably to, to be able to tell more than these sagittals. It doesn't look okay. like you have much bone involvement. It looks like mostly soft tissue. Yeah. Okay. okay. So it is in the canal? Is that what's happening here? I need an axial, really. Yeah, it's in the canal. Okay. Um, here's one slice here. A little bit. Not much from that picture. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so there's definitely epidural expansion uh, extension there. And, um, you know, so based on this, this, this was biopsied as an osteosarcoma. And uh, it's interesting, this patient had primary lung cancer, which was treated with chemo radiation, um, and then had this growth of this mass right next to that area. And so the thought was that this was likely radiation-induced osteosarcoma uh, in that area. So, you know, this patient was presented at tumor board and uh, like we've discussed many times in this forum, uh, you know, this patient underwent preoperative. The thought was that we could resect this um, and, um, and treat this as a primary uh, bone tumor. And so this patient underwent preoperative photon, proton radiation uh, with this extent of disease, okay? So now during the cycle of radiation, she developed weakness, okay? Three out of five strength in the legs, okay? And required urgent decompression, okay? Um, and so this is always a tricky scenario, right? Um, patient has a primary bone tumor, no other sites of disease, epidural extension, uh, do you go intralesional? What do you do here? So I uh, had to do something. So this is a pre-op CT. Uh, and you can see, uh, so I took the patient for emergency decompression. Uh, and again, this patient was about halfway through their protons, did the decompression, uh, cleared away enough epidural disease, um, and left it at that. And this is the post-op MRI showing some... Uh, you can see the contour of the spinal cord. But then six weeks later, this happens. Um, and so, Wendy, what do you think of that? She's about three weeks into protons. You know, you can see the extent of the laminectomy. Um, Sorry, you're, you're on mute. Ah, uh, sorry, muted again. I was just saying there's, you know, there's that new pathologic fracture. Yeah. You're decompressed, so it's probably not compressing the cord, but um, you do have that new focal kyphosis. So now, how's the function now? There, there, uh, uh, he or she is able to get back up once it got a little better once they got decompressed, and now that's right. That's right. Yeah, the function is a lot better. The function's a lot better. So yeah. ambulatory uh, improvements with physical therapy, exercise. Um, yes. Um, so the radiation was complete. So we went ahead with um, stage resection. Uh, considering on block resection. So stage one, this is posterior T1 to T8 instrumentation. You can see the kyphosis that's there, okay? This is the intraoperative view. Uh, this is the patient's prone. This is right side, left side. Left side, ribs have been taken down. That's the pleur on the lung that you're seeing there. Uh, this is what's uh, the tumor uh, within the bone here. Uh, the chest wall, the ribs have been amputated lateral to that fixation, as you can see here. Uh, this is just a sheath that I've wrapped around the spinal cord just to protect it um, for in between stages. Navigation probe here, na using navigation to help guide the osteotomies. And stage two, this is uh, the position. So um, right side up, left side down. You can see the incision from the back here before. This is from her previous thoracotomy and um, for the lung cancer, which we utilized. And uh, this shows the opening here. And this is just the anatomical view. You can sort of see the, I'll show you a better view, but this is the spinal cord fecal sac here. Okay, but just to get your orientation right. 
Uh, this is the uh, the resection here. This is the uh, vertebral body. You can see the outline of the vertebral body. This is the mass, and this is that uh, patch they use to reconstruct part of the chest wall and the uh, the lung on that side that was all taken out uh, on block. Uh, this is the resection cavity. The spinal cord is there. This is a P32 radiation plaque uh, that we place at the time of surgery. Uh, you can see the extent of the resection cavity here. The rods posteriorly, there's a, there's a drain right next to the spinal cord. Uh, higher mag view, this is a cage reconstruction, expandable cage, bone graft, spinal cord, rod, drain from the back, okay? Post-op image here, looks pretty good, I would say. So you see the expandable cage over multiple segments. Uh, probably didn't get all the way to the end plate there as what I had hoped, but um, fixation above, fixation below. Okay. But now three months later, she comes in with head drop, chin on chest deformity. So this is a problem, right? And the question I have is, you know, would you guys have gone higher the first time? Would you have gone? We stopped, I, I stopped it at T1 because I didn't really want to go so far up in the cervical spine at the time. So we did this operation for oncologic reasons, pathologically, margins were clean, everything looks great. She finished, you know, obviously she had her radiation, but now she's got a real deformity problem and she can't lift her head up. Screws have not backed out. Everything looks okay. But what do you think? Nader, would you have gone higher the first time up with the surgery? To be honest, no. No, I, I wouldn't. You know, I mean, I would not... Uh... Three up. I mean, it's, I mean, it's adjacent segment disease. I mean, how how high up you want to go? I mean, those lateral mass screws. I mean, if you want to do lateral mass fixation, like let's say C six, they they they're not that good anyway. Yeah. So I wouldn't. You know, I mean, your best fixation is T one, and you've uh, and you you were there. You achieved that. Any fixation above that, short of uh, a par screw of C two, is poor fixation. Unless you're talking about like pedicle screws. And the in, in subaxial cervical spine, which, which I really don't do as a primary option. It's a salvage procedure. But, yeah. but no, I would I would have done the same to be honest. Uh, on, you know, um, in terms of high up, how would have would have gone? Uh, T1 would be definitely uh, where I would have stopped. Yeah. So this is what it looked like, and like uh, you know, this is classic. You know, Ed Benzel gave us a talk. He he loves a trapezius sign, right? This is what you see with patients with kyphosis, um, and it's pretty prominent here. Um, so we obviously had to fix this. So I did this with, uh, intra I, we did some traction before halo traction, and this wasn't a fixed deformity, uh, pretty flexible here. Um, but so I did it with a staged, uh, multi-level anterior cervical and then back that up, uh, posteriorly, uh, as you can see here on the, uh, this is the interoperative x-ray and then followed by, um, the, uh, the postoperative CT. Okay. But the problem that I had afterwards was, is, you know, this patient had surgery before. She had proton radiation, uh, cro almost crossing incisions in the back, and we couldn't close it. Um, and so this is the view that we had. Um, very tough to close upper thoracic spine. I see Goodwin chuckling over there. So he, 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 uh, he, he must have another good story or something. He can relate to this. So it's very hard to put them together. You see the rods and the screws and the drain. So called plastic surgery, I actually had them involved in the beginning to uh, turn the latissimus flap, uh, took a little more time uh, to get it to heal. Um, and eventually it did heal, but you can see the extent of their soft tissue repair here um, that's there. So overall, she healed just fine. Uh, and that's usually where uh, talks end, right? So we talk about, oh, you gotta use plastic surgery. They're great. Everything heals well, drains uh, for a long time. Uh, and five years later, this is her alignment. Looks pretty good. I mean, I, I'll, I'll take this. I mean, I think for any type of deformity operation, that's a pretty good result, right? But then now, this is what's happened, okay? So five years later, yes, it healed, Latis you know, latissimus flap, and now she's got protruding hardware, okay? So you can see, you know, un under these nice pink uh, sort of uh, flower-shaped uh, stickies, She's got this sticking out. So, so now what? I'm gonna go back, even more tissue advancements. 
This is my last slide, by the way, because I want to get to Matt, but I just, I'm just throwing it out there, you know? What does everyone think? Anyone? So when they did their lat flap, I mean, it, it seems like a lat here wouldn't cover everything. It seems like the top put would be uncovered. So did they pull, did they do like a paraspinal pull over as well and lat over that, or it looks like not? Well, they did a paraspinous flap the first time after the first stage, you know? Um, and so oh. they, there was a, so much scar tissue, you know? Um, and the lady is, the, the patient's pretty frail to begin with, with not a lot of soft tissue. So, um, but I left the question mark there because this is still to be determined uh, just because of her frailty and the morbidity, we decided just to, to watch and try to maximize wound care. But, but just to wrap up, these are tough cases. You know, we had a metastatic case. This is a primary case, radiated wound, urgent decompression, kyphosis, pathological fracture, then a staged oncologic resection with paraspinous flaps, developing a deformity afterwards, going through a deformity operation and a late wound dehiscence. So that being said, um, we can definitely talk offline, but I want to get to, to Matt Goodwin. So I'm sorry for taking up so much time, um, but Matt, please, um, Please uh, share your screen and take it from there. Thanks, John. That was uh, that was awesome as usual. Let's see. All right, is that working? Are you seeing uh, the regular what you're supposed to see mode? Yeah, we're Thank seeing you your just... we're seeing your slide deck. Good. All right, so uh, uh, thanks for that, uh, uh, John. That was uh, that was great. I'll try to uh, move quick and, and hit the, the pertinent things here. So I appreciate uh, everyone recognizing my expertise in complications. Um, hey, Matt, maybe Matt, just blow so it up. Matt, you're not on the presenter view, though. We oh, see your that's, on the yeah, side. sorry, that's what I was asking. Let's see here, okay. I know how to fix that. And you don't have to hurry. You have plenty of time. Let's see, I've done this before. How's that? That's good. Yeah. All right, so complications obviously come in all sizes, big and small. Um, this was a real comment after I took out this big desmoid out of somebody's flank, uh, not from my fellow like it's shown here, but uh, from staff that said, gosh, that looks like a stomach. You're, you're sure that's the tumor, right? Uh, that would be a bad complication. Um, but you know, as we've already seen, and as everybody here knows, there's lots of complications in, in spine tumor surgery um, from the, the, the regular stuff, the hematomas, the bleeding, um, to the clotting, and then all the other things that come with, with uh, uh, regular spine surgery, like placing hardware and worrying about where it is, uh, like this screw that doesn't look perfect, obviously. Um, screw was not as bad as it looked. Uh, this was a recent screw we had placed uh, kind of scooted along the right side of that lamina trying to do translaminar screws and was taken out and revised to a, to a pedicle screw without a problem and the patient did great. Uh, but the point is that, you know, the, with spine tumor surgery, you have all the regular hardware issues uh, and, uh, and then all the other things that come with the tumor like, like you've seen. So this is my conclusion slide, and I wanted to put it here because I think this is like the point of my talk. And I think this, these are the points that I'm going to keep hitting on during the cases. And, and it's just a function of, uh, I think, how I was trained. And so uh, on the right, you see uh, me and Dr. Shuba's clinic. So here's Shuba over here, uh, probably having one of our typical ridiculous clinic days. And, uh, and then down here, you see Kevin Jones, who's a, a orthopedic oncologist uh, at Utah, who I, I learned a lot about uh, uh, these sorts of things. So the main points I think are, you know, setting the patient expectations uh, is absolutely critical. Um, and, and as, as Shuba is excellent at doing, being very direct about that um, is something I've tried to do with all these patients. And so, you know, a patient might say, uh, so if you take out my, all my sacral nerve roots, you think I might have some bladder issues. And, you know, Shuba would always be like, you will definitely have bladder issues, you know, and, and just, just hammer it into them. And it seems to help, I think, once you get into the weeds with them during, you know, the post-op course, if there's, if there's issues that come up. So for example, this was a case I showed last time and it was all high fives and this rare tumor and we took it out. Technically everything went great. We were really stoked. Um, 
but you know, and, and there was no tumor in our three month post op. But I was reminded, uh, and looking back through my cases, that you know, when she came out of that surgery, her right hand was numb. And during the end of the, the middle to end of the case, we had pro problems with the SSCPs and we played with the positioning. The positioning seemed totally fine. Uh, we weren't messing around with her neck at all. Um, and that recovered, but it took a couple of weeks. Um, and she clearly had some sort of positional palsy. Uh, but, you know, I was, I was very happy that I laid so much crepe with her about this surgery. And her comment after all that was, you know, with, with all the potential things that, that can happen in these big surgeries, I'll take a little hand tingling for six weeks that gets better. And so she was, I think, very well prepared for the process. Uh, and, uh, and we even talked about it with her family. Hey, we had some weird stuff at the end of the case in the right hand. And I kind of said to him, I don't think it's anything, but I want to tell you in case it is. And, and I'm glad I said that. Um, and the only other thing I want to say is that, you know, uh, I think we oftentimes say that, you know, like the hemonc doctor is kind of the quarterback during the care of most of our patients. And, and I really think we're the quarterback during their surgical stay. I mean, I think we're the, we're the person that's the best advocate and, and knows the patient the best and can take them through the post-operative course uh, uh, when they're, when they're dealing with, when we're dealing with different services. Uh, so here's Brandon Lawrence from Utah and Dan Shuba, uh, two of the guys that trained me, you know, and Shuba would always talk about how when you have a complication, you know, he'd always talk about putting your arm around them. He'd always be like, you know, they're your best friend now, you know, and you're going to round on them twice a day and you're going to get them whatever they want because you're, because, you know, you were part of that and you're going to solve it. Uh, and, I, and I think that's, that's, that's great. All right. So here's the case, 60 year old male, uh, painful paraspinal mass, uh, he's had, so he had metastatic Ewing sarcoma five years ago uh, in his back, but also in his lung and a few other places. Uh, I was treated with chemotherapy and radiation, uh, and he's been disease-free for three years now. Uh, so it comes back and looks like a local recurrence. Uh, the, the oncologist uh, called me and, and, and wanted me to, to talk to this gentleman. Uh, he's intact. Otherwise, he does have uh, radicular pain uh, wrapping around his chest, but, but otherwise is doing fine. So here's what his imaging looks like. Um, so you can see this is a T7, 8, and 9. Uh, he's got a large mass that uh, uh, goes into the, uh, the neural foramen at each level, goes into the pedicle at each level. And if you look at the axials, it actually goes into the rib head and, and comes around a little bit uh, uh, on the side uh, as well. So what do you want to do now with this guy? You've seen him. He's got this tumor. It looks like a local recurrence. Tell people they need to vote. All right. Now you're getting some votes. A lot of A's. Good. Good. We can keep moving. Yeah. So, you know, it needs to be biopsied and restaged, you know, uh, like the usual thing. So gets a spine tumor workup, gets an MRI, the whole spine, gets all the other stuff. Uh, and the biopsy comes back as Ewing sarcoma. Uh, and we started planning. There was no other lesion uh, recognized uh, anywhere else. So we come up with our plan. Medicine says really the first line here is local resection with radiation. Uh, Radong says uh, yes to radiation, but they're happy to do it you know, before or after, depending on our preference uh, uh, or without us, basically. And I passed this case around. We presented it amongst uh, uh, our tumor board uh, with surgeons and a few other folks looked at it. And I kind of said, you know, I think it's real hard to make the case for, uh, for a non-block option here. There was clearly epidural spread. There's clearly stuff going on the front. And this is a metastatic case, uh, uh, you know, five years ago. So I, I think making the case for big surgery was, was pretty hard to do. Um, it would be only for if, if they felt like it was a better, you know, durable response to do that uh, and or if they needed separation. So the plan was for radiation only at this point. Uh, Radon called me the next week. They'd done their sim and they said the, the epidural spread was a little more than they thought or, or maybe it had changed and they said they can't really get the dose they want and they prefer surgery. So, uh, so we moved forward and did the surgery. And so um, the, uh, you can see what we did here. Uh, we went uh, T5 to 11, uh, all from the back, uh, uh, lateral extracavitary approach. We took out you know, the end of seven, eight, nine ribs you can see here and then took out the pedicles as well. Uh, surgery itself went great. You know, we lost about a liter, uh, no complications during the case, tied off the nerve roots at 789. Uh, we had our flap team do a, uh, a rotated uh, lat over the, over the paraspinals uh, to hold it all in. And there was no, nothing funny. It was a really good case. No pleural leaks, no bleeding, uh, nothing like that. 
So here's what we did. Uh, you can see on the left here, uh, the, uh, the fecal sac and the, the tied off nerve roots at each level. Uh, this is a humerus that I've cut in half and uh, placed in there and kind of shaped it to provide really cord protection, also another uh, level of support in the back here. Uh, and then here it is uh, uh, with, my, uh, with my graft and then the lat pulled over here, right? And here the paraspinal is under it uh, and it closed up uh, nicely. So uh, at this point, we're all happy. Uh, here are just a few cuts from the case uh, where you can just see that we, uh, you know, took off the rib like we said in the pedicle. You can see our graft in the back. There's eight, there's nine. A lot of high five at this point. So moves all four limbs uh, at the end of the case. Uh, little swollen, so the two uh, stayed uh, in place overnight. Uh, got to the unit and uh, got a chest X-ray like like we always do when we're when we're close to the lung, even though we didn't have a problem. The lung lung fields look great here. The next day I'm in clinic and I get called around, oh, I don't know, noon, one, something like that, and says the patient got extubated, got short of breath 30 minutes later, reintubation failed. Uh, they're still bagging them now. They ended up bagging them for about 30 minutes because they couldn't get a tube back down. Uh, sats were in the 30s. His maps were, were in the 50s. Uh, in, the in the process of bagging, he develops a, a tension pneumo. Uh, he then gets a chest tube after that. And then after that, he has these hours uh, where he looks terrible, where his lactate goes up to 10 or 12 and stays there. His maps are in the 50s. Uh, he's on all sorts of pressors. Uh, his pH is down to seven. Uh, they bring the crash cart in the room. Uh, they end up, uh, at some point, they end up shocking him because it looks like he's dying. He's got these occasional arrhythmias. All in all, not a, not a real good situation. <laughs> And so what do you, what do you want to do now? So, you know, the, the question is, are we going to keep doing the ICU care and, and trying to tank them up and figure out what's happening? Uh, are you going to run back to the OR because you think he's bleeding? Are you going to go back and open him up? Uh, or are you going to take him uh, uh, to the scanner and look for something? And, and is he stable enough to go to the scanner? Matt, that's a pretty significant post-operative change. I mean, what was your, what, what were you, would you were worried about a PE or what do you think was happening? Cause it seems like there's something metabolic going on here. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, initially it was actually, um, I, yeah, that's a great point. Right. So to all of, you know, I think to all the surgeons here and probably Wendy, probably to everybody, but you know, all of us see that and we go, boy, that's, that's intense. Like that guy is not doing well. And, um, you know, when I got to the ICU, uh, this might answer your question, kind of what I'm what I'm thinking here. So when I got to the ICU, I'm not, I wasn't totally sure that was recognized by everybody. So one of the first things was like, well, maybe the blood pressure thing is because he tied off the nerve roots, and 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 it was a sympathetic thing. And that was kind of a comment, and 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 we can roll through that quickly because because most of us here know that. But that's not, you know, tying off three nerve roots on one side is not going to do that to blood pressure. And we can uh, review this uh, later, and we can. Well, this is worth saying, right? You you can't hurt the cord, right? But that even that is is um, you know tying off three unilateral roots at that area is very unlikely to have a problem with the cord. Um, and the you know there's been a whole bunch of work looking at this. Uh, so this is getting away from the blood pressure issue. But uh, you know, and, and everyone always gets taught about the artery of Adenkowitz and how you want to make sure you don't take it and how it's a very tenuous area of the, of the spinal cord. But, you know, there's been a lot of work on this. I think this is a great summary of kind of what's been done in this area uh, uh, from uh, uh, these guys uh, two or three years ago now. Uh, and basically, a lot of the work where we're, we're nervous about at Enkowitz is out of the CT literature where they're, where they're clamping the aorta. And, you know, there's no cord injury if the, you know, if Adenkowitz isn't involved. There's some cord injury, you know, five or six percent. Uh, if it's involved uh, and it's reopened, but if it's not reopened, so if they clot off uh, that area, you know, they have this incredibly high injury rate that, that we actually don't see in spine. So even in endovascular repairs, that rate is much, much lower. Uh, and, and, and I think it's important we recognize that while they have all this literature on the vascularity part of it, it those aren't great models uh, for the spine. Uh, and so, you know, in the deformity literature, they talk about, you know, clamping off roots and monitoring for five minutes before you tie them. Uh, in spine onc, there's some, some dog literature where it suggests, you know, you could probably get five to seven levels bilaterally uh, before you start to get flowed down to half of normal to the cord. And so there's this, this area where it seems like you can even do, you know, or this 
I guess, thought that based on all of this together, you could do bilateral three levels uh, tying off roots and, and very unlikely to cause a problem, even if you take uh, Adenkowitz. You know, not to get off in the weeds here unless, unless John or someone wants to, but you know, so what do you do? Do you clamp it and do you wait for a change in your, in your SSEPs? Well, you can do that. Uh, I can't say that I, I do that. Uh, maybe I will. Um, the problem is it takes some time for that change to happen. Uh, and then a lot of these papers, when they look at the deficits, you know, it's, it, there's a big range for when the deficits happen afterwards as well. Neuromonitoring is not perfect for the clinical outcome. And you might be taking that area anyway. And so I feel like a lot of times you don't have a choice when you get to that. So you're, you're already committed to, to whatever you're doing. And so I don't know that it, I don't know, John, if you're in the, if you're in the business of the clamping and waiting or what, but, but. Yeah, I, I don't really do it. I mean, I, I use, I think when I first started, I did, I was very paranoid about that, but then I don't know. Um, I just, I just like them. I just take them honestly. So yeah, so I, you know, I kind of said that's, you know, none, I don't think any of that's an issue. This is a very, you know, doing unilateral three levels, not you know, very unlikely to have an issue, very unlikely to have any sort of pressure issue, but also with the cord. So the next several hours, again, he looks terrible. Um, you know, what do you, what do you guys want to do? Uh, I think maybe you can vote on this one, or maybe we've already voted and I just don't see it. I think a lot of people voted to take him to CT. You didn't tell us if they were stable enough, but yeah, right. So he looks terrible. Here's just a, a snap snapshot from the chart showing, you know, that his pH is, is tanking and uh, his, his lactate's super high and this guy's in a bad spot. And so I think the, um, I think the first thing was trying to make it clear to the ICU that this is a life-threatening condition. I mean, this guy's doing very poorly and, and something's wrong. It's not just that he's doing bad from a surgery. And so my thoughts exactly, John, were, were around, is this bleeding or is this a clot or is this something I'm not thinking about? And I really didn't have data to convince myself this would be bleeding. Um, you know, his H&H &H had remained stable. When they put that chest tube in, it was air that came out. His drains were normal. Um, his face started getting swollen and dusky. They did an echo bedside and basically said it looks, you know, there's a little effusion. They can't see everything in the SVC, but not exciting. Um, and he does, he does have a history of clotting. He, had, he clotted off a right uh, uh, IJ five years ago. So I, yeah, I agree. I took him, I said, look, you know, I kind of told the ICU, like at this point, you know, especially when somebody said, you know, let's see how he does over the next couple hours. I said, I don't think we have any more hours. This guy's clearly doing poorly. Um, we got to, you know, we got to get him the scanner and at least figure out what we're dealing with. So we got him under the scanner and he's got this, uh, uh, well, I've, I've spelled it out here. So he's got this large uh, SVC clot uh, that then also a, a left IJ uh, clot as well. Interesting thing about this case is, you know, the, he had a CT done about a month before during the staging stuff, and he had clot in that SVC at that point, um, and, it was, and it was not red, unfortunately. Um, and, I, and I can't say I'm in the habit of, of looking, you know, back up to the, to the SVC. Wendy, is that a, is that a um, you have any comment about that? I'm glad I don't read chest. I cut it out around the spine. So yeah, no, I don't really have a comment. Um, I mean, sometimes the mixing artifact is difficult. If it was sluggish, maybe they didn't realize it was clotted. They thought it was slow. I'd have to see the rest, but I mean, those things happen. Got a hundred scans and things probably, yeah. I don't right. know. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious there, Matt. I mean, would a clot like that, do you need contrast to see that on a CT chest side and pelvis or? Is it, or do you need a contrast study? I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just curious. I think you would, yeah. You do, yeah. So the, um, so what do we do now? Well, you know, obviously uh, we'll, we'll move it along here and say all of the above. You know, the nice thing was the ICU recognized that we'd been tanking this guy up with, through an IJ right into this clot and didn't have any other access that was being used. So they got a femoral line in and he got a little better. And then, uh, and then I talked to vascular about him uh, and it was interesting because um, uh, they were, vascular was outstanding. We were dealing with this in the middle of the night and um, they, they're the one that said, look, I think there was clot there before. And this is just, you know, and so he wasn't totally convinced uh, this would necessarily do it. He, he was kind of saying, I'm not sure. He said, I'm happy to open it up, but he did say, you know, um, he did, we talked about the nerves thing again, but 
Uh, he also said, you know, if they have a femoral line, let's get this guy in a little better shape um, because I might, I might, you know, he might not be able to handle me doing this now because uh, if I cause a PE, it might kill him. And so we gave him a few hours with that femoral line and then he went in and did a thrombectomy and the patient immediately recovered. Uh, it, was, it was actually dramatic. Um, and he was uh, weaned, intact, doing great. Everyone's high-fiving. Uh, we go to the floor. Uh, that's the story, five to 11. And then it gets over a week out. So we're post up day 10, hanging out on the floor, mobilizing a little, doing really well. All of a sudden he gets sick one night, his white count's 25. He doesn't look good. It says he doesn't feel like eating. Then he's got this hour air time where he loses his vision and then it, in one eye and it comes back. And then he starts getting hypotensive uh, and his maps start dropping. Uh, and we get these, uh, his chest x-ray over the last two days. He's got a developing effusion on the left side. So it gets to be about midnight where he's getting worse and worse. The intern's calling me and uh, his maps are fluctuating now. His systolics are down in the 70s. Patient feels sick. Uh, so, you know, you, I mean, you might not have all the info you need to answer this, but you know, this guy's not doing well. So uh, I put him right back in the ICU got him scanned from there. He had this huge effusion. And you can see, if you look uh, on this left side, it's now tracked out into his chest wall here. Uh, and you can see uh, 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 some, of the, some of the air here as well. Our area still looks pretty good. You know, if you go through it, the, uh, you know, there's a tiny little kind of seroma looking normal post-op stuff. And it looks like the flap actually kind of protected us from a lot of the stuff that was, was seeping around. So we got a chest tube, two liters came out. Of course, it's infected. Uh, so now he's on antibiotics. So great. Now here's the story, you know, SVC syndrome, pleural effusion, infection. And then they get a brain scan because the, the vision uh, uh, issue they're worried about. Maybe he had a little mini stroke. And, uh, you know, and then the, they get this CT done and they say, well, there's no, no bleed, but boy, this area in his basal ganglia looks a little darker. It looks like something that could add a little stroke or something. So, you know, recommend getting an MRI. So everyone, you know, that's dealt with these patients probably knows the unfortunate way this is going, right? So we get the MRI and of course it comes back that he's got, that he's got brain meds. So no more high fives at this point, you know, uh, metastatic disease in the brain and Ewing sarcoma is pretty rare. Um, you know, We've obviously talked about should there have been a pet at some point, you know, would, should we have caught this earlier? Uh, but it's pretty rare. It's, it's, you know, one to 3%. We talked to the oncologist uh, about kind of restaging and whether they needed any bone marrow stuff and kind of all that already. Uh, and this is now an adult local recurrence five years out, you know, it's becoming more rare where we don't have data to, to really pull from. So he's dealing with a new diagnosis. They're planning on radiation for this. Another week goes by here and I uh, get called to the floor. It says bleeding from his, his, his back and it won't stop. I actually got called out of the OR and I meet him in the ICU and, and, and you know, his chest tube stopped and he's, uh, uh, he had evacuated hematoma into his bed and now he has all these loculations everywhere. And so I look at this and he's got, well, I don't know if Wendy, if there's, if one cut does you any good at all uh, about uh, commenting on these about your, <laughs> your loculated pleural effusion. Right, there you um, go. So, looks I mean, bad. It looks like you still have, I mean, an infection on the outside of the chest as well with that air in there. Yeah, so this got worse, that's exactly right. So, I, so, so his incision opened up because this tracked all the way around, got worse and eventually came out uh, the incision, but, but our flap stayed over our area, which was, which was actually kind of nice. Um, <laughs> but these terrible loculated areas, so, so we talked to CT surgery, which was kind of interesting because the original thought was um, you guys need to wash out the spine and revise the incision and, and we don't see you later. Uh, and I said, I think his spine's okay. Uh, looks like it came out in the chest wall, chest issue. No, it's not. Yes, it is. So what do we do? It's Friday night. And so I basically said, hey, look, I'm happy to take him into my spine room, but I need you guys there and I need you scrubbed for us to start because what's going to happen is I'm going to get this hematoma out of the chest wall and if I get into the chest and there's a bleeder somewhere, I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble. And so that's exactly what we did. Um, he was totally fine with that. And uh, you know, we evacuated all this hematoma out of the chest wall. 
you know, I guess the only comment I'll make about this is I've been in a case like this, uh, not in the chest, but in the pelvis, same thing, patient doing poorly, hematoma to get evacuated, and we didn't have uh, uh, the vascular tending scrub right then, and we didn't have blood in the room, uh, and there was a big bleeder underneath that once we decompressed it, the patient started tanking, and uh, uh, had Shuba not, you know, put his finger in the, in the iliac vein and stopped it, we, were, we would have lost that guy. So, so having blood in the room, I think, is, is key. Uh, so, yeah, so ended up needing a VATS, you know, a few hours later to get all the stuff out of the rest of the chest. And so to conclude, and, and we're kind of out of time here, I mean, I think, yeah, expectations obviously are critical for this. Being direct is key. Uh, and obviously transparency and available, you know, I kind of, I try to have my arm around their shoulder and say, look, we're going to, we're going to work through this no matter what uh, comes up in this process. Uh, so with that, I uh, thank you. And, and obviously I know we're out of time, but, but I'm happy to take any questions or comments. I think the audience is just so shocked by your story. They don't even know what to say. Um, <laughs> and you went by the punchline so quickly. I, I don't know if everyone heard it because we were all expecting a stroke and you showed brain mets, which in five years out, from you in sarcoma, extremely rare. Who would have ever guessed that? I just want to make sure the audience all caught that part because that was really something. Yeah, Although, it, was big, it was all really something. So yeah, it was a big bummer, right? Because I kind of, you know, he was, he, I was. It was hard, right? I mean, and I even mentioned it to him in passing, like, yeah, boy, that would be really rare. I mean, but because he didn't want to get the MRI, and I said, yeah, we should get it. I know you're asymptomatic. We should get it and see. But that would be, you know, and sure enough. And that would have been, uh, yeah, you're right. Unfortunately, we are over time because that would have been a really interesting discussion also to see how you screen these patients before you actually go in and do major surgeries, um, like who screens the whole body and does PET and stuff like that. But we'll have to save that. You'll have to come back another day and we can continue with that discussion. So John, thank you so much. Matt Goodwin, thank you so much. Great cases. So real fast in the last minute, I want to, Koi, Dan, are you there? I want to pass it to Koi for next week, um, maybe. If you have any news, or maybe you don't. I'm here. <laughs> uh, the speaker previously invited uh, just had to bail out. So uh, stay tuned on social media for uh, what next, next week's um, uh, session will entail. But we'll be here, 6 o'clock Eastern time, Thursday. For sure. Court is in charge. Well, thanks, everybody, so much. We're over time. And we appreciate you joining in and email Twitter, text, whatever our host with any questions you might have. And we'll see you next week. Yeah, thanks everyone. <laughs>